Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Ed. Aisha Tyler. A tribe Call Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz, Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Hello and welcome to the TalkHouse Podcast. I'm Josh Modell. And if you had told 15-year-old me I'd be doing a podcast with today's two guests, I would have asked you what the hell a podcast was before getting truly excited. We've got Perry Farrell and Daniel Ash. Now, Perry Farrell almost certainly needs no introduction, but here goes. He first found fame as the singer for Jane's Addiction, a band that bridged the gap between glammy metal and some burgeoning thing called alternative rock, and he's pretty largely responsible for the latter becoming a thing. The end of Jane's Addiction in the early 1990s was the beginning of Farrell's other big creation, the Lollapalooza Festival, which continues to this day. The U.S. version was just this past weekend in Chicago, as a matter of fact. Farrell has played with other people over the years, and the legendary Jane's Addiction has reformed in various incarnations as well. The big news for 2024 is that the band's original lineup has reformed both to play shows and even to record some new music. Check out a little bit of Jane's Addiction's brand new song, Imminent Redemption. This week, Jane's Addiction will embark on a U.S. tour with the band of today's other guest, Daniel Ash. Love and Rockets formed from the ashes, pun intended, of the legendary goth band Bauhaus and features three of that band's four members. The original Love and Rockets run from 1985 until 1998 resulted in a legendary string of albums that was influential on an entire generation of tough-to-define bands, definitely including Jane's Addiction. Love and Rockets has reformed a couple of times over the years, the latest being a successful run last year that marked their first time together in 15 years. Doesn't seem like there's any brand new music on the horizon for Love and Rockets, though last year's My Dark Twin gathered some hard-to-find tracks. For now, why don't you re-familiarize yourself with their biggest hit, 1989's So Alive. In advance of their co-headlining tour, Farrell and Ash talked about how they keep fit enough to rock this hard after all these years, which includes taking a day off between each show and utilizing superfoods instead of hard drugs. Ash talks about how three of the biggest songs of his career were written and recorded in one day each, as well as how Ziggy Stardust changed his life forever. They also chat about the joy of collaboration and the potential up and downsides of AI. Enjoy. Hello, darling. How are you? There you are. How are you, Perry? I'm good. Doing well, Daniel. I mean, every day has got its challenges. Yeah. You've been a busy boy, big time. I guess so. Uh, To me, it's it's nothing. It's just a typical day, just working away. Yeah. But I mean, all those gigs you've done in Europe and everything. Uh, How many gigs did you actually have you done? I mean, well, you haven't really stopped for a couple of years now, right? You know, it was original, all original members. I think it was a seven or eight week. Right. My voice started to stress at the at the very end. Does yours ever stress? Uh, yeah. If you do three in a row, right, it's fucked. Terrible. After three, it's screwed. Yeah, it really is. Two is okay. I say no. I say no three. No. Right? No. It, We've got it really perfect, this tour. Well, this one, this is what I'm, I'm personally, I thank you for this, and it's fantastic. We've never done this before in any band I've been in, the three bands, or solo or anything. One day on, one day off. One yeah. day on, it's yeah. fantastic. Oh, my God, you're going to be able to recharge your batteries on that off day. It makes so much difference. I've never done a tour like that. So that is brilliant. Was that your idea? Yeah. To do the one up. Yeah. It, well, it's fucking perfect. Thank well, you for that. Uh, you, you're very, very welcome. But it comes from the theory that nobody can put their heart out and leave that heart out on the stage and be expected to go and do that again the very next day. And then the very next day, I want to give the greatest show. Like every show is life and death for me. I'm exactly the same. Yeah. Um, if I don't get uptight before a gig, something's wrong and the show's going to be shit. 
I like to get uptight, wired. There's been the odd time when I've been com- very, very rarely, very rarely. I can pretty much count it on one hand in the whole time I've been doing this where I've been complacent and it's a shit gig. It's just you make mistakes because you don't care. And, and I really hate that feeling. So I completely relate. It's great to feel that nervousness before a gig and not take anything for granted. And as you know, when you're on there, you're on another planet. It's You're not on planet Earth. You're floating about four inches off the ground mentally. It, it's yeah. such a different feeling from anything. Yeah, I think that once we start to really get into the music, there's a music zone. You know, it's, yeah. it's not quite tangible because we can't see it, but it's absolutely there. If we could see wavelength, if we could see job. Oh, yeah. It, it would be there and there would be and we would see the angels that would want to come to the show, too. Surreal. You can't do that night after night. You need to have a day for the voice. Yeah, I agree. You need a voice and you've got to stay on top of the voice. You've got to keep the temperatures right. You've got to have, you know, uh, the tinctures. Yeah, I take Akinacia as well. I've been using this partic- and particular stuff. There's this guy down in Venice. Uh, he's called Dr. Schultz. I've been on his stuff oh. for 20, 30 years. Yeah, me I too. His, oh, you know about Schultz? Yeah. I do his superfood every day. And the odd oh. day that I don't do it, I feel my age. And when I do it, I feel like 25, like most days. It's incredible. I haven't had any of his in a while. I had, I bought like every tincture. Yeah. And I have them in a box, but this is a terrible story, but like, in the age of in the age of crack, I was always in looking for pipes, pipettes, you know. So right. I would break I break his pipette, and I guess that's that's why I stopped using uh, his stuff. But now that that's behind me, I'm going to go out and get a case for the road. Well, if you run out, Perry, I've got I'm bringing two pots of the Superfood Ultra. I've got the Akinacea. Uh, I have all the other stuff, the internal stuff that I use. I'm like a little Dr. Schultz chemist guy on the road. So, if you know, it's a bit of a joke about me. They call me Dr. Ash because I've got all his stuff and I've been on it for 20, 30 years. The Superfood Ultra is what you want now. That's got everything. And then you want to get the uh, Akinacea Plus, which, again, stops you getting a cold big time. Yeah. And the other one is I take the Formula One, which uh, makes you – regular let's call it big time i've been on that stuff <laughs> it's like this is a this is funny that we're talking about this so you're like a young man you know like once the heavy drugs the hard drugs were out of my life i started to get into health and i so enjoy working on my health so here's something i want to turn you on to it's called lipus there's like nine different colored boxes and then each one is different. This glutathione could be for um, intestinal, could be. But yeah, man, ritual. Wake up, live and die for the message. Live and die to get up there and turn the world on to the music that they, they've been waiting for. They grew up to it. It changed yeah, who they were. That's who we are. Well, I noticed that this particular tool, um, I know it was successful in Europe, but Somebody's t- a few people have told me that a lot of tours this summer are bombing yes. internationally, but this one isn't. Right. We are happening. Yeah. It's like people want to see us. It's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and as you know, we're getting added up to nine more gigs at the end. It's fantastic. The combination of us guys, Love and Rockets and Jane's Addiction together, people want to see this after all these years. It's like this tour is selling really well. Thank you for the invite, big time. Thank you. It's more than my pleasure. You're one of my favorite musicians. You're still alive and well and doing your thing. And I think it's because we are authentic and we're genuine in everything we do musically. You know, my son, I have two boys and uh, both are musicians, artists. Sometimes, you know, we'll listen to music together and I'll get very angry at, at something. My son will say, relax, Dad. They're not really musicians. I said, well, what are they? And he, he would say, they're products. Yeah. So you feel a little better. And I got it. My son's super wise. Like, he's one of those guys that when he was a baby, he looked to me like 
he was going to be able to like tell me deep things once he became a man. And it's really starting to happen. It's very true in our industry. Since the advent of the home computer and the cell phone, basically the World Wide Web began in 1991. What it's being used for sometimes is amazing. And sometimes it is horrific. Yeah, I agree. But it's kind of easy to fool the public. I have to say, you, you get a tween and you get a tween to kind of have a crush on somebody that might not have that much talent, but they might have a big booty or they might, you know. Yeah, not- but if you notice, that stuff is limited. When somebody does have success, it's like I even say with somebody like Britney Spears, she has to have the talent to last as long as she has lasted mm-hmm. because you get the difference between a one hit wonder. They don't last long. You can tell at the end of the day, you can only fake it for so long. It always comes out in the wash in the end. But there are certain so-called, let's say, you know, the Taylor Swifts of this world, they have real talent. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there for so long. They wouldn't be able to handle it. And they would, with her, for example, I do respect her because she writes her own stuff. And you can tell. I've got great respect for that. Yeah. That sort of an artist. To be super commercially successful like that. But to me, she has real integrity because she does write that stuff. And that tour that she's done, it's incredible. Right. You know, a million, but a billion plus dollars. But apart from the money side of it, the fact that she's actually kept her head on straight and is delivering every night for this yeah. amount of time, I've got a huge respect for that. Right. Even with the technology. You can only bluff it for so long. The real stuff will always shine through. And that actually comes back to us because we are the real deal. You know, that is the difference. Yeah. We try to book Lollapalooza every year. We're always looking for who is the one this year or who are the who are the handful this year that have changed the world as yeah. you know, as we live and, and fall asleep, wake up. The world is moving around. We're looking for musicians. And it's easy with the advent of computerization to make someone who's very average marketable or sellable. I know, but they've still got to play live. If they don't cut that's it live, why that's our, the that's, proof. That's why we're doing well. Exactly. You got People it. People have heard Yeah, you have to see them. Somebody told me just the other week, they said the difference between you guys, Jane's Addiction, et cetera, is you can actually go out there and play gigs. And you can actually, you're not miming. You're actually playing gigs. The new generation, a lot of them apparently don't do that because they don't have to because they can press a keyboard pad. Right. But it's becoming rarer and rarer to actually be able to go out and play. And they also don't understand something. You know, it's, it's a spiritual thing. You need to suffer to experience suffering so you can write a song about suffering so that the person who's listening to it and suffering can relate. Yeah, exactly. I used to get people coming up to me way back in the 80s, and it it was funny enough, it was on a Tones on Tail tour, and this girl came up to me in the street after the show, and she said, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart to stop. You stopped me committing suicide three times. And it was a shock to me at the time. I was like, what? And, you know, I sort of was trying to laugh it off. Uh, But I understand what she was saying, because what it was at the end of the day was she related to the music, Turns on Tales music, so much that she felt she wasn't on her own. And before that, she always felt on her own. And when you're a teenager and when you're in your early 20s, I mean, I still feel pretty alien now. I'm I'm a solitary person. I'm not very social. Nor am I. But then it's like, I know this was the same with you, with Ziggy Stardust, David Bowie. When that came out, when I saw that on the TV at 15 years old, he's doing Starman. He puts his arm about Mick Ronson. I know it's an old story. That to me is like, oh my God, that's that's my sort of person. That's yeah. where I want to live. Yeah. I want to live in that world, not the world yeah. with all the um, the jocks at school. I wanted nothing to do with that. And yeah. I wanted to live in this fantasy land with these androgynous people. And it, it's never left me. And I know that's exactly the same with you because I've read a few things about you talked about that same thing specifically with the whole Ziggy Stardust thing. So it's yeah. like a ticket. It's like the look of an electric guitar. Uh, the look of great clothes, you know, a cat suit, it takes you out of the mundane and it takes you to this land where your soul, your heart and soul want to live. 
It takes you away from the mundane. That is a great job to have, you know. And you're accepted. The paradox is life then is flipped. And it's the one who's the odd one who's really running the show. Oh, yeah, absolutely. At school, me and Peter Murphy, we had problems. We, you know, we had problems with the jocks big time uh -huh. and after school as well. But going back to that thing you said about the suffering, I, I've noticed it's a, it's a bit of a dilemma, but all the best songs come from an extreme emotion. Right. An extreme downer. When I think of, really? well, actually not always. Also, I've found the emotion of extreme joy can also create the songs that are on that level up there, the hits, if you like, for want of a better word. The hits come from an extreme emotion, whether it be an extreme downer or an extreme upper. That's what I found. And also, I don't know if you found this, the best songs are the quickest to write and record. When I think about Bella, recorded and written in a day, Go, recorded and written in a day, So Alive, recorded and written in a day. Those three just come to the top of my head. Recorded and written in 24 hours. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have found the same thing. Well, you know, I like to say there's a million ways to write a great song. Sometimes it could come out of somebody else's mouth. Yeah. And you're at, in a circle of people, you're having, you're all talking, and somebody else says a phrase. Yeah, yeah. And you, and you find the phrase, you just go, that's got to be a song. Yeah. When I talk to my son about songwriting, so my son is now 22, and um, he just... He doesn't have a lot of, um, he's not sure of himself. But he, he hasn't had that much life experience yet. For one, but he doesn't want any help from me. Like I, we've had conversations where he said, you know, I, sometimes I think that I, I was cursed to become your son. And I, and I asked him why. It was pe all people want to talk about half the time is you. And I, you know, what I say to him is, you know what? I, I completely can relate. I know how it must feel, but just understand this. I believe that you are going to do it. You're going to do it your way. The fact that you don't want help from me is a great sign. Yeah, right. I know, I know some parents, they have kids and their son is already wearing like leopard prints, but they, they have no uh, substance. I, you know, my son has been working on songs. Sometimes he's been working on a song for like a, he just can't get it half a year. And I try to, you know, give him help. I say the best way to write a song is go and be with people. Go out. Danger is a great addition to any song. People love being thrilled and in danger and it makes them laugh. And when they survive it, it makes them feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can write a song a million ways. It could start with the phrase or it could start with a melody that you've got. And then you're taking a phrase. It's usually one of those two things. But the other thing that I found, it often helps if you can have a collaborator as well, because yeah. sometimes... I've sat down in a room and tried to write something and I've got drunk and I've got stoned or whatever to try and get open those things in your head. I mean, I still, you know, use, use alcohol for that because it opens everything up. But when you have somebody else to bounce off, right? you know, somebody on bass, somebody suggesting right. something, so a drummer, somebody banging on some books in right. a room, just something to get away from just yourself. Otherwise yeah. you can get so stuck in your own thoughts and that, you hit a brick wall. You might want to suggest that to him if you haven't already. But, you know, not just going out, but on a practical level yeah. of somebody making a rhythm so that it can inspire you to get the words rhyming or, or whatever. Right. Uh, one other person can often really open right. things up. Yeah, I've told him that too. I say, you don't have to put all the pressure on you. Now, if you're writing a song about a subject that you want to own that subject, You've got to do your work, but you can get so derivative of your own self. Yeah, exactly. That you can literally ruin your own career by not yeah. wanting to collaborate. Collaborate. Absolutely. I, I won't yeah. name names, but I will go so far as to say my favorite musicians start to believe they are, you know, they are the one. They, uh, 
They don't want to hear it from anybody else. They put their name on it and it's the, it could be, you know, it has to be their name. I try to stay away from that. When I was a young man, I wanted to be in a band. As hard as bands are, bands are super pain in the ass. Perry, Perry, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. I know exactly what you're talking about. I relate 100%. There is a lot of similarities between Jane's Addiction and Bauhaus. The chemistry is extremely similar. We always thought that. We said it when we went on the road with you guys back in, I think it was 87, uh, around that time as as Love and Rockets. And we we noted, and I know about the pain in the arse thing, because you've basically got three or four big old egos. Yeah. And you've got to balance it. Otherwise, the band disintegrates before it should. Right. But if you can, if you can just keep it together. Right. You get that magic and you get it recorded. And that, at the end of the day, is the thing, to get that recorded. And most of the best bands, they don't last long because they burn really fiercely. Or they don't realize it, but the song that they're writing sounds exactly like the song they wrote on the last record. And then they're writing another song that sounds exactly like the song they wrote three records ago. Like, my favorite people, my favorite people, if they don't grit their teeth and collaborate, they become so same. Every song starts to sound the same. Even my favorite people, as much yeah. as I love them, I I look for the collaboration these days. I'm not only collaborating with James, but I collaborate a lot with the, with the dance world. Right. The way I like to write things these days is a song can be written with a guitar, uh, purely folk, st- you know, string guitar. And then that could be taken and de, you know, rearrange and organize and find the best bits and make it into a dance song. You know, you get really, when you write a song, you really are just getting content that can be used for two songs. Well, I've got a thing going with outside of, of Rockets. I've just, well, it's been, we've got the album in the can. It's a project I'm doing. It's uh, Ashes and Diamonds, which is the bass player from Sade, Paul Denman, and the drummer from Pill and myself. That sounds interesting to me. I want to hear it. Yeah. Again, talking about doing different things because I, you know, Love and Rockets was from a long time ago and I do want to do some, we all want to do something different after this. Right. And I've got, we've got this album in the can and I can't wait to get an, on and promote it. But again, it's working with different people. Yeah. And uh, how we started this off, because when we started it, COVID had happened. So I ended up, just getting uh, drum loops sent over to me and then working that way. And we managed to come up with a bunch of stuff that way, but it's nothing is like three human beings in the room, in a cheap little rehearsal room with some big old PA speakers and just plugging in and, and, and work. You know, you ha- I find I have to have a lyric. Once the lyric's there, then it can be worked into a song. If you haven't got the lyric there, it just goes nowhere and it's a jam and there's nothing worse than that for me. But again, working with fresh people, with these two guys, which are completely different, again, we've got a really good record, a good and actual album's worth of material. And I can't wait to get out there and promote it, you know. And you've got to, you've got to keep moving forward. Yeah, it's like creation itself. It's beautiful. But every single creation on God's green earth is unique. And that's what's so special about creation. And when you honor that, you can write endlessly. I'm always obsessed with trying to sound different all the time. Like I noticed that with Rockets, each of the albums did sound different one from the other. We do essentially an electric or an acoustic album. But there does there comes a time sometimes, I think, when I've found this, where but I just work in spurts. I have a sort of a really creative spurt for a year, and then I'll do nothing for 18 months. So I, I'm not a constant person at all. So... I was going to say, because of what you're saying, you can keep creating, you keep creating. But I do find that if you actually have a break from doing, let's say, specifically music, let's say you just take six months off. When you come back to it, everything's fresh and novel again. And I find that I can create something worthwhile, not just another song. It's a special song because I've had six months or a year off from it, all of it. 
Then I come back and it's like playing the guitar or singing again like it's brand new. And there's something to be said for deliberately taking a big old break from it. Have, have you found that? Well, I don't do that because I have so much in my head that I want to say. I'm really about the message, driving the message home with music. But I have not done art. I have not done art. So this tour, I'm bringing art supplies out on the road with me and I'm right. doing art again. Right. And I'm excited about it. It's really funny life. Somebody can say something that you you know you hadn't thought of before and completely change your life. You get an idea. So I have lots of art books, lots of poetry books, lots of books about mysticism. I'll, I look down, I'll read something about of the mystic and the way the words roll off the tongue becomes my rhythm. So I work from it differently. I, I used to sometimes use an acoustic guitar. I I uh, stopped doing it because there are people that are better at it than I am. I only want the, I want to collaborate with the best people. Like I would love to collaborate with you. I think we could do an incredible job. And if we got somebody from the dance world, that would be really, really interesting. But we could start it out as a four piece or a three piece and then turn it into a dance song. Or a two-piece. Or a two-piece. Or a two-piece. Because I, I think me and you could do some really strange and wonderful stuff in a studio. Right. I don't you, you were you using that play, Johnny Depp's place? I think you I, th yeah. I know you were actually because you were working with uh, Robert. Remember yeah. the English guy? He's yes. great. Because yeah. we finished the Lashes and Diamonds album at his place he's terrific yeah but uh yeah that could be something in the future and even different producers to produce different effects i just feel that there's a message that has to come out in our generation i find our generation is going to change the world forever i, I believe it's the beginning of a great time for mankind i think that people that hate some of these low frequency thoughts that are on earth will soon disappear. We won't even be thinking them anymore. There is a sense out there right now that that is beginning to really happen. Even the so-called, let's call them jocks or whatever you want, are even cooler. They're opening up to the idea of yes. UFOs, extraterrestrials, Job. other forms of intelligence. Even the lowest common denominator are becoming yeah. open to that. I think technically we are right now in the age of Aquarius, which is the age of great turmoil and change, like a real shift. I think it's actually physically actually happening now. We are just touching on the age of Aquarius. We're coming out of Pisces, from what I know, into right. Aquarius, which again is great turmoil initially and change, but then it lasts for a thousand years. Then it's supposed to be a type of euphoric state that lasts a thousand years. I'm sure you've read about this as well. Yes. And we, it feels like this is going on right now. Yes. And I think just having the, just having the internet, because now people can't hide. Exactly. Information is there, right there. If somebody does something right. bad, within five minutes, every, the whole world knows about it. Right. But so nobody can hide anymore. Right. So the next thing to do is figure a way that we can make lies easy to identify. I'm not sure how to do it yet. I, I think one way to do it is have the have almost your own internet that is a collective of highly highly minded thinkers, artists, musicians. That is happening as we speak. What is that thing? Is it called TED? TED Talk, TED? It might be a little smart. I'm talking about something even simpler, like you were saying, like you even think that, you know, the, the jocks, I agree with you. I think that the jocks, the consciousness of the world is definitely, we're evolving. And we have to hang in there and write about it, sing about it, dance about it, um, unify that's what is so special about what you and I do is we're unifiers. We bring people out. Now, the, the computer, you can do some funny, tricky things with the computer so you can make yourself look beautiful, uh, you know. And then when you meet 
you. You're nothing like that. Okay, now you saying this leads on to something else, which is right up there, right now. AI. What the fuck is going to happen with AI? This is this is this is changing everything. I was going to embrace, or I want to embrace AI with this new project I'm doing, Ashes and Diamonds. I don't want to just be another three-piece rock band. I want to embrace AI so I can take it visually to another place. Nothing to do with this boring little planet Earth. The world is your oyster with AI. You can turn it into anything. That really excites me. The only thing is, I think everybody's going to do it. So let's say you turn yourself into, you know, I've got a song about aliens, specifically a love affair with an alien, for example. So I could do the obvious and then, you know, you you know, there's me there in a visual with the alien that I'm in love with, this female alien. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's going to do it. So what do you do? The well, it's going to it's opening up the visual side of things with AI to such a degree that it's almost I'm thinking out loud here, but it's almost you would stand out by going against it and going back to an acoustic guitar and wearing a pair of Levi's and a T-shirt. Sometimes that's all that's necessary. Well, it is. Uh, yeah, it's called Bob Dylan. It's just happening now where I'm noticing people don't know. Or they go, if they see something that's extraordinary, they go, oh, well, that's not real. It's AI. Where is this? This this AI thing is really turning, going to turn everything upside down. Nobody's going to know what's real. Unless you go to the oh, Well, okay, yeah. But you know, the, you know the whole thing with the, um, what do they call it? Um, they did it with Tupac in 2012. Oh, a uh, hologram. Um, yeah, yeah. There's that whole thing. I mean, Kiss are going out and doing it. ABBA are doing it right now. Uh, that's great. It's something to see. Yeah. I don't have a problem with that because... I would like to see that. Yeah. I, I don't really want to go and see Kiss, but I wouldn't mind going to see ABBA. Yeah, me too. We'll go together. Yeah. Somebody sent me some footage from England. And so everybody's going to uh, get on it. But I'm talking more about the thing of um, with AI, where you can create absolutely anything. But where is that in itself going to get boring? Because it'll yes. be the case where everybody's seen everything. Yeah. So where do you go from there? Back to reality. What I'm saying is I don't want to go back to the mundane acoustic guitar with jeans and a T-shirt. But that might actually, the only way that could actually be refreshing, I suppose. But I'm trying to draw out of you. What do you think is going to happen with AI? Because it is it is changing everything right now. It's just started. And right. it's uh, so-called reality will be so hidden because of AI. It could be an absolute nightmare because nobody will know what is real and what isn't anymore. Right. You see that possibility. It's a scary thought. Right. You can see an autocrat trying to lie his way into vote for me because I can, mm. you know, take us on a ride, a trip to the moon and back again for dinner. And uh, yeah, well, that's happening already. <laughs> you know, Elon yeah. Musk is going to be doing that. Yeah. Exactly. This is what I, you asked me the question. So I'll, I'll yeah. give you the answer. I think that you cannot beat nature. And it, I don't mind. I'm not afraid of the AI. Um, when I see AI artwork, I find it interesting. I find real artists more interesting because, like uh, I was telling Etty, I'm going to start drawing again on this tour because I, I stopped when the industry, you had to know how to work on a computer to be an artist. And it kind of limited me. And she said, are you crazy? She said, people want to see what you've drawn. That's a real talent. To have a machine driving something, it's a machine driving something. It's got a, it's yeah. got value. Like, like, I like dance music. I like it a lot. You know when I liked it most? When you had to be really dexterous, ambidextrous with your hands and be able to beat match with two records. Yeah. Right. I found that so interesting. And the sounds that I was hearing, I had never heard before on, you know, when there was just like 1970s, great rock. Uh, there was the, these new sounds now that you can make with a computer. I found some of them, especially the lower frequency ones, cool. So I want to I want to work with them. You know what I want to do? My life's dream is to throw a party in the Holy Land. 
out in the desert where we could have holograms in the air if we want. They're not real, but we can make aliens dancing, doing tango, and we can have all types of art. I, I'm i not afraid of it because I believe that, I. this sounds silly, but I, I'm just going to say, I just believe Ja loves his children. Ja loves us. Everything he introduces, we can handle. The interesting part is, how are we going to handle it? I want to embrace it with this project I'm doing with this band, Ashes and Dimes. I want to embrace it. I was just putting out there the question, though, that well, being well, human, when ourselves. you get to when you get to the stage where you do everything, 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 there are no limits. I suppose as humans, we'll work it out. But where do yeah. you go when there are no no limits? That in itself, I think, can be dangerous to your psyche when you have no limits. It could send you insane. That's what I think I'm getting at. But where do you where are you talking about where there's no limits? There are limits. Here's an example. I've seen one or two specific artists that I wanted to use to do the visuals for some of these songs for that band, Ashes and Diamonds. Then I saw their stuff and went, God, that's amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. But after two weeks, I never wanted to look at it again. So I'd seen that, done that. Did these guys, they did AI? To, to yes. Yes. Art? That's what I'm saying. It was, it was one particular okay, guy. Now, you gave yourself the answer that I would give. I would get a little bored of looking at something that I know was generated over and over because my favorite artists, I felt their pain. And a computer will never, ever feel the pain the way that I felt the pain. That that computer will never give the love that I want. I think computers have their place. As an example, just right off the top of my head, what about uh, Blue Monday by New Order? Computer generated, mixed in with, well, it's basically the beginnings, just like Donna Summer. Hybrid. The beginnings of computer generated music, but it works wonderfully. Yeah, but it's hybrid. Those precise beats work and they are computer generated. Yeah, but you also have the real singer. Actually, yeah, I take it back. You're right. You, that's the big, big difference. You have either Donna Summer or you have the, you know, New Order, real singer. Yeah, you got to take it for what it's worth. Yeah. You take it for what it's worth. What is it worth? It's the difference between letting it take you over and just using it to your advantage, I guess. It's just that I found that when I first saw this guy's computer-generated imagery, it was mostly of humans and aliens mixed together. I was blown away by it. But then after seeing it for two weeks, I was blasé about it. Because the artificiality, yeah, I, you know... There it is, I think. That's what you're saying. It's not got that human... It hasn't got the grit of being organic, of being human. That's the difference. Exactly. That's why I've always had in our shows live dancers. Yeah. That's why I always, when we do, you know, think of production, I always think, yes, you know, visual projection, but I, you know, give me dancers too. It all has its place. Yeah. But if you're going to just give me a, a song and that you auto-tuned, I might like it for uh, the day. Or if, it, it, if, if that, I like real drama. I'm not afraid of it. I, I seek it out. I love the imperfection of Joy Division. His singing, he makes... So he's out of tune so many times. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't they're matter like at all. my favorite parts because yeah, yeah, I get he's it. Going out of tune because he can't handle it. He yeah, can't I get it. It's happening. real passion there. So, so that's something. So there, there it is. We're coming to a conclusion. I get it. What we like because we are flesh and blood because we yes. are organic is yes. we like and appreciate the imperfections. Yeah, they're the things that touch your soul. Yeah, they, that's who we. That's really why hopefully. It. The computers won't take over because, again, with this AI thing, it's something that I am fearful of. Um, it does come up with me that, you know, they're talking about they can make computers now that are much more, in an academic sense, in much more intelligent than hu humans, and they can take us over. That, I think, um, is a concern. There will be a time, very if not already, yeah. where they can take over the show. Yeah. Now, think about that because I... I'll tell you what, I used to have this fantasy when I was a kid 
And it was almost like a premonition. When I was 10 or 12, 15, I used to have this thing. Whereas I thought that computers then, um, robots, would take over the world and I'd be one of those guys in the underground on a motorcycle with a submachine gun shooting and killing all the robots and going, fuck you, let's get back to nature. I used to, I had this premonition back then when I was a kid that I'd be one of those guys living in a cave, reacting against the perfection of the computer, the whole 1984 thing as well. Okay, So, so what well, I suppose I- I'm asking and, and saying to you is, that's something with AI that I think yeah. is of concern because they could take over. There is a chance that somebody could make something called uh, the at- supercomputer, the atomic bomb. Well, that yeah, look what happened there. There, we could we could be destroying ourselves at any moment. I know there it is. But I don't concern myself to the degree. I love the Earth so much, and I love the the people and the animals, and and the oranges that are growing on my tree. I love them more than I, a, a, a computer could never give me. I'm in complete agreement with you. The sound of running water. Running water. I love. I, I have a yeah. running water going all day just outside so that I can stay peaceful. No, yeah. I ja, have a couple. Ja yeah, same is thing. Organic. Yeah. Ja, you are a singular the most wonderful, talented, you make me so happy. I think you're so darling. A computer could never give me the feeling that you give me. You yeah. know about me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, that, snap. Same here. Yeah. It's funny when you say about, because I've got a, a little, I've got a little fountain in the back garden, a little fountain in the front. We've got skunks that come at night. We've got squirrels. We've got um, uh, lots of different animals. It's great. And the biggest thrill we're getting at the moment, me and my girlfriend, is that there's this one squirrel. She's just had little ones. She's so tame. She There's one of these squirrels and comes and picks peanuts out from her hands. She comes up, grabs the peanut, looks at you and eats it in front of you and then runs away unless you give her another peanut. I get more of a thrill out of that than any computer graphics I've ever seen. So there it is. This is the conclusion we've come to is organic is best, organic rules at the end of the day. Use computers, but don't let them use you. Yeah. I'll see you in a few weeks, man, in Las Vegas. Yeah. It's great talking. Great talking. That was, that was so much fun. <laughs> and I think we, I, I thought we'd have a lot in common, and I think we do. So, hey, man, see you in a couple of weeks, okay? I can't wait. I can't wait. And rest yourself. You've working, been working real hard. Thank you. You do this. Okay. See you later. Thanks for listening to the Talk House podcast, and thanks to Perry Farrell and Daniel Ash for chatting. If you liked what you heard, please follow Talk House on your favorite podcasting platform and check out all the great stuff at talkhouse.com. This episode was produced by Myron Kaplan, and the Talk House theme is composed and performed by The Range. See you next time.